Good morning, and thank you for taking the time to join us today, whether you're attending here on site or in the virtual world. Your presence and participation is what makes this gathering so valuable. Today is International Talk Like a Parrot Day. Pirate, I should say. But it will, I will spare you my Jack Sparrow accent, and we will also not be going on a treasure hunt. I'm Luc Laven, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's ECB's annual research conference. It's our flagship research event. We have an exciting agenda ahead, filled with excellent papers and insightful discussions. And we will have opportunities during the breaks, if the chairs do their job well in terms of timekeeping, to connect with one another. This year's conference covers two major topics confronting central banks. First, monetary policy in an era of high inflation. And two, the changing financial landscape with a rise in non-bank finance and what this could mean for monetary policy. Indeed, our economy has gone through a series of shocks that have pushed up inflation to levels that at least I thought were unthinkable not that long ago. The experience of central banks during this high inflation episode raises fundamental questions for research related to the dynamics of inflation, price stickiness, and the pass-through of monetary policy. This burst in inflation came against the background of an economy that is experiencing rapid technological change, and not least in the financial sector. The rise of non-bank finance poses several challenges for financial stability, including the future of banks, and may have implications for the financial sector at large, the financial cycle, and monetary policy. Today, we will have papers dealing with each of these topics I just mentioned. We will have 10 paper presentations in total and the Jean Monnet lecture. Each paper presentation will take 25 minutes, followed by 15 minutes discussion and 15 minutes floor discussion. The keynote lecture will last 40 minutes, followed by 10 minutes floor discussion. And unfortunately, only the audience here on site can ask questions for technological reasons. So the guiding principles as follows. Should you want to ask a question, please raise your hands. Someone will come up to you with a microphone. Then please stand up, mention your name, keep your questions brief, and um, don't ask too many questions uh, so that others also have an opportunity to speak. The chairs will choose from the various hands that are up, and I apologize in advance if um, not all of you will have an opportunity to ask questions. So um, I wanted to just say where we are. We are at, indeed at the ECB, but we are also in a very special room, which is normally used for the ECB press conference, where our monetary policy decisions are communicated to the public by our president. I hope this inspires you even more to contribute to the discussions we will have over the coming two days. I wish you all productive and an engaging conference, and I look forward to the conversations we will have. Thank you again for being here. I will have the honor to chair the first session, and we will start with the paper, The Economics of Financial Distress, Financial stress? Financial, Financial stress. Um, and it's presented by Dimitri Sergei from Bocconi. So, Dimitri, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Um, uh, let me thank the organizers for uh, inviting uh, our paper to this great uh, conference. It's a pleasure being here. This is a joint work with Chen Lian and Yuri Gordnichenko uh, of UC Berkeley. And I will talk about the economics of financial stress today. I want to start with these two motivating facts. One for sure is super well known uh, that a lot of households are financially constrained. For example, 
a fifth of households cannot cover an emergency expense of 400 dollars in such a, developing, a developed country like the United States. Uh, a second fact is that finances stress people. For example, according to American Psychological Association, finances, finances is uh, number one stress for 80% of Americans. This is a lot. Uh, moreover, um, um, we don't see stress in most of economics literature, such as macroeconomics and finance. However, uh, uh, there is a lot of evidence from other branches of economics uh, and psychology, such as behavioral economics and development economics, uh, that, stress that, uh, that stress the fact that stress affects people big time not only through our traditional channels uh, that we use in macro and fin finance, uh, where, for example, financial constraints prevent people from smoothing their consumption and asset allocation, but also through depleting cognitive resources, making people less productive at uh, economic tasks. There is a, a very popular idea in development economics that goes like this. Uh, this stress uh, can lead to um, um, uh, to individual le uh, level poverty traps uh, in the following way. Poor people, uh, they're poor, they stress, they underperform at work, they earn little, they stay poor, and the cycle repeats. However, again, I stress this idea is sort of absent uh, from uh, many branches of economics. And so what we do in this paper, uh, we combine this traditional take uh, or, or financial constraints that prevent consumption, smoothing, and asset allocation together with behavioral approach to thinking about financial constraints that lead to financial stress. Uh, and we study the implications of this. So we do it in two ways. Uh, specifically, first, uh, we run a survey, a large survey in the United States to document the prevalence of financial stress uh, among the people in a developed country. Uh, and study the implications and the data uh, of this stress. And then we build a tractable intertemporal model of consumption, smoothing, and labor supply with financial stress and present the implications of this model. So just like two words before I start showing you how we obtain our results, our results will be as follows. In our US-based survey, uh, we find uh, that most of the people are stressed because of their finances. Uh, for example, uh, a median respondent uh, spends about six hours per week uh, thinking and worrying and dealing about financial issues. And this, uh, this uh, and other measures that we uh, obtain, measures of financial stress, correlate with being financially constrained. Then uh, we build, uh, we take a standard of the shelf macroeconomic model and uh, introduce financial stress there. And, and we find two interesting implications. First, financial stress by itself doesn't make people uh, get stuck at their borrowing constraints, uh, uh, unlike uh, uh, a, lot of, uh, uh, a lot of papers in development literature sort of uh, suggest informally. And the idea is simple. If you understand that your assets, your saving behavior affects your future stress, you have yet another incentive to save on top of standard precautionary savings that we find in standard macro models a la Bulli and Ayagari. So these people run from financial constraints like hell. On the contrary, if you assume that people are not very uh, uh, familiar or do not internalize the fact that their saving affects their future stress, uh, they're naive about uh, uh, the, the stress concept, uh, people get stuck at their financial constraint. A lot of people are at their borrowing constraint. Second finding uh, uh, that I will discuss today is that the presence of this financial stress uh, helps alleviate this counterfactually negative uh, wealth effect on labor supply that is present in most macroeconomic models, but not uh, quite in the data. And I'll explain uh, why this happens. And so these two facts, they have a lot of implications. Uh, I will mention a few of them, uh, uh, in particular the effects on some policies uh, and welfare implications, but there are uh, many more. So uh, let me show you how we obtain these results. Uh, I will start with a survey. 
So we run this uh, uh, large-scale U.S.-based survey on, uh, on primary age U.S. workers, representative of general population uh, along several key dimensions such as gender, uh, age, uh, income, and education. And so we start by, uh, by asking a qualitative question uh, to rate uh, the uh, amount of stress people face on a scale from 0 to 10. And so this histogram indicates that uh, most of the people are financially stressed. Uh, about 15% of them, they're extremely stressed. Only 7% of people are, uh, are not stressed at all. Uh, the median is 6. Then uh, in our survey, uh, we uh, go one step forward. We start asking quantitative questions. First, about the time people waste uh, uh, through uh, this state of financial stress. Some other questions like uh, spending behavior. So let me highlight a few results. Uh, in one of the questions, uh, we asked them, uh, again, motivated by prior development literature that finds that people become less productive, they waste time at work. We asked them, how many working hours were you distracted by your financial concerns? And we find that about five hours a week, a median respondent wastes at work. And this is given that on average, uh, a person works 40 hours a week. So this is a large amount. Uh, phrase slightly differently and ask about, uh, g in general, time spent dealing with uh, stress, financial stress, we get slightly higher number, a median respondent, uh, a respondent in our survey spends like uh, six hours. Again, uh, uh, numbers uh, seem uh, quite significant uh, and uh, quite consistent with some prior literature that documents this prevalence uh, of financial stress. So we go one step further and we ask uh, people about their spending behavior. So it turns out, uh, uh, I mean, it's probably familiar to many of us, uh, but it's also well documented in psychological literature that imp uh, impulsive spending is one of the mechanisms people deal with stress, and in particular with financial stress. So in our uh, sample, uh, a median respondent spends about 100 bucks and this is 2022, uh, um, 100 bucks a week uh, to deal with, uh, uh, to try to alleviate, alleviate financial stress. So this accumulates to $400 a month. Again, a significant amount for an average person. Now, um, these measures of financial stress that I have just presented, they, they are correlated with the state of being financially constrained. So we go uh, a standard, uh, and take a standard way to baptize people into financially constrained by asking them a simple question. If your household experienced an unexpected emergency, would you need to borrow money in order to pay for a $2,000 expense? Uh, and so we allow them to choose from these three uh, options. Uh, no need to borrow, need to borrow, and cannot pay. And 10% of people in our SAMO cannot even pay for such an expense, uh, even by borrowing. And so now we can, uh, so uh, this we will treat as people like very financially constrained. And so now I can break down these measures of financial stress, asking our questions uh, by this state of uh, 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 fi uh, being financial constrained in several categories. And for example, people who cannot pay for this emergency expense uh, are stressed at work for about 10 hours, while those who don't need to borrow, they can cover expenses from their pocket, they only stress for four hours. So there is clearly some relationship between being financially constrained and these measures of financial stress. And this is not just this measure, but a more general measure, qualitative measure, and even that measure uh, on, about um, uh, uh, consumption. Now, uh, to summarize, there is evidence there is, there is some significant amount of uh, effects of financial stress and it correlates with uh, financial constraints. So now we take this uh, uh, and plug in a standard temporal consumption smoothing model and the new element uh, in this model will be the presence of stress that drains your available resources from your productive work. It attains its maximum at financial constraint and then dissipates the further away you are from financial constraint. Importantly, 
uh, we borrow this idea from uh, behavioral literature on present bias. We will allow households to be either sophisticated about the uh, understanding of the presence of stress. So today you feel stress, but do you understand that your saving behavior affects your stress in the future? No, that's the question. So our households will be either naive or sophisticated. And so uh, we take uh, more or less standard um, model uh, from heterogeneous agents uh, literature on consumption, saving, uh, and labor supply. Uh, it can be summarized with this one line. Household maximizes util expected utility uh, from consuming uh, supply and labor subject to uh, um, budget constraint, uh, borrowing limit, and uh, uh, importantly, the ZT, uh, this is a idiosyncratic income state, it's stochastic. You can uh, be very productive or not very productive, and the state changes stochastically over time with uh, uh, flow rate uh, lambda. So this new element, theta, this is how we stick stress in, the, in, in our benchmark model. We will assume that this function is exogenous, decreasing with A. Um, and let me say two words uh, why, about why we stick stress in this part of the model. First, this is the most documented channel in uh, behavioral development literature or, or about the effects of stress on human behavior. It makes people less productive at, at work, uh, essentially makes your labor supply uh, costlier. And this is also very, this uh, formulation is very easy to map into our survey. So effectively, we're gonna use our survey in order to calibrate uh, this new element, theta. But in the paper, something that I don't show you today, we try to take uh, out the theta and put it to many other different places in, in the model. Like for example, it is very well documented that stress affects your decision making. Uh, and so uh, we extend the model uh, and allow the state of sophistication or naivety to depend on the amount of assets uh, uh, you own. And we experiment with many other uh, extensions. Nevertheless, this is our benchmark model. I will show you the results for this benchmark model. We set it in continuous time for two reasons. It is easy to solve using modern techniques. Uh, 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 second, you can derive some uh, formal results. Uh, in continuous time. Again, in the interest of time, I will not show you formal results, but you can go a little bit further uh, in understanding the mechanics of the model. So we will calibrate the stress function to be uh, exponential uh, with the maximum stress of theta and the sensitivity of stress to assets, uh, uh, this alpha. And the results I'm gonna show you now uh, will be based on these numbers uh, that are taken from our survey. So in our survey, we'll ask a bunch of hypothetical questions to uh, our respondents uh, about uh, the stress uh, at their borrowing limit, the sensitivity of the stress, which will allow us to calibrate these numbers. Uh, again, in the paper, we do some, uh, we perform some alternative calibration based uh, uh, on experimental RCT literature in development literature, and the qualitative results will be the same. So parameters are very standard from, from, from recent literature, mostly from Kaplan and Violante. We solve the model by, uh, using finance difference methods, and this is what we get. So uh, this figure represents the saving uh, of a household as a function uh, of wealth and as a function of productivity, which can be either high uh, or low. That's why there are two curves. So uh, in this case, the household doesn't have any stress. Uh, so this is going to be the benchmark of comparison to this, uh, uh, to, to this richer model where we introduce stress. So this is a standard permanent income hypothesis behavior. When you are not very productive, you de-save, anticipating that in the future you will be kicking in with high productivity shock. Uh, when you are highly productive, you save. And so uh, over time, oh sorry, over, uh, when you are richer, you save less or you just save more. Now, let me add the behavior of, uh, of agents that face stress and they're, they're, who are sophisticated about the presence of this stress. Uh, these are these two solid lines, the blue one and the gray one. And so the key observation here that they're on top uh, of the dashed line, which represents the frictionless case, no stress case. 
And this is despite the fact that these guys uh, uh, face stress, so uh, working for them is more uh, costly, they still save more. And again, let me repeat, the reason for that is that there is like a, an enormously strong force because this is a growth force. You understand by saving one uh, cent today, you will be less stressed to, uh, tomorrow. There is an extra uh, reason to save. And because of this, close to the borrowing constraint, so this x-axis is again wealth, close to the borrowing constraint, a lower bar, both uh, saving function in the low state and in the high income state are positive. What does it mean? Nobody will end up at the financial constraint. Again, uh, despite the fact that it's like super intuitive that this guy should fall into uh, this borrowing constraint trap. It will never happen uh, in, this, uh, uh, in, in such an environment. So another way to see it is to plot the stationary distribution of these guys uh, 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 along the state's uh, assets, and uh, the two lines represent two different uh, income, um, um, high and low. And so there is, there is zero mass uh, to the left of this red point where the saving function intersects zero. So nobody falls into, uh, into poverty trap. Uh, there is even uh, as if uh, a new borrow, endogenous borrowing limit, which is much higher than the true physical uh, borrowing limit. Now, things change if we assume that uh, uh, the, the agents in this model uh, don't realize that saving more today will affect their stress in the future. And so this is, uh, we can see from this graph, which again plots saving, uh, uh, the dash lines again frictionless case. But this time, saving uh, of this naive stress household falls going clo closer to the borrowing limit. Why? Because this force that uh, you earn less closer to the borrowing limit because you're more stressed dominates uh, everything else. And so the fact that uh, around the borrowing constraint the saving is negative uh, in the low income sta state makes people fall uh, into this poverty trap where you're trapped uh, close to the borrowing limit. So and again, if you uh, plot the distribution, it turns out that at the borrowing limit you now have uh, many more people than in a standard model like Bewley Ayagarit style model that we use. Um, uh, so stress uh, can, can kind of rationalize uh, the observation there are quite, quite a few of people uh, uh, at the borrowing limit. Now, we extend this model in many different ways. Uh, we try to experiment sticking it into productivity, uh, 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 making uh, people uh, partially productive. Importantly, the thing that I just mentioned, uh, we allow for uh, a stochastic switch between uh, naivety and sophistication that depends on assets. So this is our way to model uh, the mistakes people make uh, when they're stressed. And so this uh, key result that you need uh, agents to be naive rather than sophisticated in order to generate this uh, stress for that brings you to the borrowing limit survives. So our second main result uh, talks about the effect of stress on the labor supply. And so in most of macroeconomic models, uh, it is very well known that higher wealth make people work less. It's like negative uh, uh, wealth effect of, on labor supply, uh, mostly when you have separable utility function. Why is that? When people are richer, they want to consume more of everything, more of consumption, more of leisure, and hence less uh, labor supply. The evidence, at least some of the recent evidence, suggests that there is either zero wealth effect or a little bit positive wealth effect. Our model can, uh, can generate something like that. Why is that? Um, so mathematically, if you want to write a formula, you can disentangle the effect uh, of increasing the assets on the supply of labor into two components. One will be the standard negative wealth effect, the uh, first term here. The second one is the uh, change of stress that, that affects this utility of working. So by giving people more assets, you kind of alleviate their stress and effectively uh, make their disutility of working smaller so people, uh, people can work harder. So one uh, so visual way to see it, if you plot uh, labor supply as a function of, of assets for two income states, Closer to financial constraints, this like, stress force dominates. Uh, for each people, uh, uh, the, the standard negative income dominates. 
so that is interesting. Why? Because it has uh, 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 new policy implications. For example, uh, think about fiscal transfers. We, uh, we saw a lot of fiscal transfers in the recent past related to COVID. Uh, the traditional take, macro take, that you give people money, they become lazy, they stop working. Standard, like, negative wealth effect uh, 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 story. Uh, in our model, this is not what happens. Uh, poorer people, they will be relieved of stress and may start working more. So in the paper, we calibrate our model where we have like poor people, rich people. Uh, we try to mimic uh, the recent COVID uh, paychecks uh, in the United States and show that this $2,000 uh, fiscal transfer uh, across board uniform across people increases GDP by 1% in our calibrated model. And this is purely supply side effect. There is no new Keynesian friction, no, no nothing. Uh, this is simply because uh, they start working more because the disutility of working falls. So um, with uh, the remaining time, let me say uh, one more thing. And this is, uh, uh, this is a re-evaluation of well co welfare costs of financial constraints. So, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the traditional way of thinking it is, uh, is the prevention of consumption smoothing. Now, our guys uh, who, become, uh, who get closer to financial constraint, they can fall, if they're naive, for example, they can fall to this poverty trap, spend a lot of time near financial constraint, raising this welfare cost by a lot. So we do measure this force by uh, this money metric, which equalizes the uh, uh, value function of stress households to the value function of no stress households. Pretty standard uh, way of doing things. And so this is what we find. On the left hand side, I plot this uh, money metric measure of financial stress for sophisticated households and on the right hand side for naive household as a function of wealth and as a function of two income states. And the key message here is that this uh, well, uh, welfare cost of financial stress is like 20 times order. So for naive people, being financially stressed is a disaster in terms of welfare. Uh, why? Because, uh, uh, because, I mean, there are several forces, but the dominating force, these guys spend a lot of time close to financial constraints. While sophisticated people, they run away from the financial constraint like hell. Uh, and uh, uh, essentially making the uh, presence of financial uh, stress uh, minimal uh, on, their, uh, uh, on their welfare. Okay, so let me conclude with this. So uh, with this paper, we bring uh, this financial stress into uh, macro household finance uh, literature, which was absent before. Uh, we present some survey evidence uh, that stress is prevalent uh, in a developed country, such as the United States. And we build a tractable model that you can solve in seconds uh, and modify in many different ways you want. And, and we do it in the paper already to some degree. And, and, and all of that links the traditional macro take on, uh, on financial constraints with the behavioral uh, approach to thinking about uh, financial constraints. And so these exercises, they have two important fundamental implications. Uh, first, uh, you really need to think about the sophistication versus naivety uh, about presence of stress in order to find this interest in the facts of this financial uh, uh, psychological uh, cause of financial constraints. And second, the presence of the stress reverses the, or can reverse, uh, because these two forces fight, uh, uh, counterfactually neg a large and negative uh, um, uh, wealth effect on labor supply. So there are lots of implications. I highlighted a few, like uh, transfers policy or, uh, uh, or a large welfare cost of being financially constrained. But uh, in principle, uh, you, can, uh, you can dig deeper, uh, dig deeper and think about other implications as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dimitri. Um, Dimitri's paper will be discussed by Alina Barcher. You. you have 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Do we have? Yes, we do. OK. Um, and the pointer is excellent. 
Okay, yes. So thank you very much. It yeah, has been a pleasure to, to read this paper and uh, to discuss it now. Um, so let me start with what I think are the key takeaways. Um, so first of all, the paper is uh, making the point that uh, financial stress has important effects on individuals' economic decisions, both uh, in terms of labor supply and in terms of consumption savings decisions. Um, now, the effects that financial stress has are very different depending on which household type we are dealing with, whether these are sophisticated people or naive people. As we uh, saw in, in uh, Dimitri's uh, figures, basically the sophisticates, they are saving out of the financial constraint and staying away from it, whereas the naives, they basically get sucked in and they are falling into a poverty trap. So basically, even if they are close to their financial constraint, there's still this saving, which is obviously quite bad. Um, and importantly, there are many of these naive types, uh, naive types in the population, apparently. So uh, the paper estimates that these are two thirds of, of uh, people. So this is really macroeconomically important. Uh, overall, I think it's a great paper um, on a highly relevant topic. Um, and apparently, it has recently been accepted for publication at a top five journal. I think that is well deserved. Um, now, I nevertheless don't want to stop this discussion right here. Um, but rather think about which food for thought the paper is giving to us, because I think actually this topic is, is really exciting and there's a lot more to be done and potentially you could really start like a whole agenda based on this. So let me give you a few thoughts that I had. Um, so my first points relate to how to measure financial constraints. The question that households were asked in uh, the survey that uh, Dimitri and his uh, co-authors ran was if your household experienced an unexpected emergency, would you need to borrow money in order to pay for a $2,000 expense? And we already saw the nice diagram. I just have the numbers here. So basically, 46% roughly said they, they could just pay it. And then uh, around 44% said, yeah, well, I could pay it, but I would need to borrow money in order to do so. And then around 10% were saying, no matter what, I could not pay this. So this suggests at least 45% are at least somewhat constrained. Now, just for the fun of it, I looked into the 2022 SCF because the survey uh, in the paper was also run in 2022. And I just put up some numbers here um, for different financial concepts, basically. So if you look at liquid assets, for example, in the SCF, then uh, the median value is slightly below $8,000 and about 29% of households have less than $2,000. If you look at financial assets overall without subtracting any debt, you get a much higher number, almost $37,000 and about 20% of people having less than $2,000. If by contrast you look at net financial assets, so you subtract financial debt, then the number is of course lower, so around $17,000 and around 39% below $2,000. Now I found a number for the uh, median net financial assets also in, in the paper for the survey um, uh, run by the authors. Um, that was slightly lower, namely 5,000. I didn't uh, uh, find an exact number of the share below 2,000, but at least uh, the, the answers to the survey question suggest that there's many of these people. So it seemed that depending on which underlying wealth uh, concept you use or which assets you're uh, talking about, you could get different answers uh, about how constrained people are. And I was wondering whether people might even think about different concepts themselves, even if you ask them about the same thing, and maybe, maybe also depending on when you're asking them. So um, maybe households perceive themselves as more constrained than they actually are, because there is some mental accounting or narrow bracketing going on in the background. And of course, this is important because in the model, basically, um, you have financial stress modeled directly as a function of, um, of assets, of net financial assets. So um, this relationship between basically um, yeah, financial stress and um, assets is, is pretty crucial. I was also wondering if there could be a systematic perception bias on the side of households in the sense that households who worry more about their finances um, might also be more inclined to just answer to the survey question, no, I could not cover this emergency expense. And then finally, the survey was um, conducted in April to May 2022. And this was basically when the recent surge in inflation in the United States was at its peak, 
also the war in Ukraine had recently broken out. So I was wondering whether maybe the like, baseline level of financial stress might be a bit lower at other times, and this was just really a like, high stress time. So what I was taking away from this is, first of all, it might be interesting to study also other countries and maybe also other points in time. And then second of all, maybe also a bit influenced by my <laughs> Scandinavian microdata background, I was thinking it would be super exciting to link such a survey to administrative data to get a more comprehensive and not self-reported picture about the relationship between financial worries and people's actual financial situation. The next set of comments is related to the life cycle. This is something that was just briefly mentioned in the paper, but I found it actually very interesting. Namely that the data suggests an inverse U-shape of financial worries, which peaks at around 50 years. So I was thinking, okay, what's happening there? First I was thinking, oh, maybe these people have a midlife crisis. And I thought, hmm, well, I'm not so sure, but it's the US, maybe this has to do with um, their children entering college, because in the United States it's very expensive. So, I was wondering, do we find a similar pattern in other countries? And then, like, even if it's just for one country, this life cycle dimension I found very intriguing. So uh, we know that also financial constraints vary across the life cycle. Now the paper tells us also financial worries um, vary across the life cycle. And I was just wondering how these two forces basically interact in shaping individuals' behavior at different points in their lives. And so I thought it might be very interesting to explicitly model the life cycle dimension. The current model is focusing on prime age employed workers, and it might be interesting to really consider the whole life cycle and maybe also study how financial uh, stress is affecting the elderly, how it relates to old age poverty, and also how it um, interacts with unemployment and how it affects the unemployed. Then. Another set of comments is related to, well, I call it household and risk. So the model is assuming a unitary household. Um, but then people <laughs> tend to argue a lot about money and finances. So I was wondering, how does this relate to household formation? Um, I found this YouGov poll, which is actually exactly from the same month, April to May uh, 2022, um, when the authors were also running their survey. and. Um, they were asking people basically about um, the, the main um, reasons for arguments in, in, in couples. And as you can see, okay, the pointer doesn't work, I think, but as you can see uh, highlighted there in yellow, money is the top two reason. So uh, it's, it's really a factor that couples yeah, uh, argue a lot about. Um, so how does financial stress affect household formation and stability? Does it affect matching? Does it affect divorce risk? I could very well imagine. Um, could within household insurance actually mitigate financial stress? Or could, actually, uh, could it actually be the case that matters are made worse if two financially stressed people are basically uh, uh, coming together in one household? Um, yeah, and um, maybe also the gender dimension might be, might be interesting. So it could be that uh, the labor market supply effects of financial stress differ between men and women. And then apart from Divorce risk, another type of risk that came to my mind when reading the paper was, of course, financial risk. So at the moment, the model is only featuring risk-free assets. And therefore, I was wondering what would happen if we introduced a risky asset and how does financial stress actually affect portfolio choice or vice versa, because I think it could very well go in both directions. Yeah, and um, my last set of comments uh, is, is, is related to policy. So um, the, the model is suggesting substantial welfare losses, especially for the naive individuals. And um, as mentioned earlier, these are many individuals. So uh, yeah, around two thirds of, of the population, according to the estimates in the paper. Um, so I was wondering if there's something we can do to help these people. So can we, for example, inform them? Can we educate them to become more sophisticated? Maybe an interesting first step would be to, to run a randomized controlled trial and um, give people information about basically the, the, the behavioral biases uh, they, they suffer from. Maybe tell them, you know, uh, if, if you're close to the financial constraint and you uh, basically do not save, then you will be more financially constrained also in the future, because some people seem to fail to internalize this, that basically if they don't save today, this is not just a problem for today, but also for tomorrow, and that they will be in trouble again tomorrow. Um, 
And yeah, more generally, I was wondering which policies might help to avoid that people fall into a poverty trap due to naivety about financial stress. Is there anything we can do in terms of regulation, maybe design of like smart products, certain account types that help people to, to commit to their savings and yeah, not uh, succumb to their financial stress? And um, last but not least, the, the paper is uh, uh, talking about uh, fiscal policy um, and yeah, that's basically financial stress is really important for fiscal policy transmission um, and that a lump sum fiscal transfer can actually relieve financial stress and thereby increase labor supply and output and I found this really interesting, like that we have this mechanism that can like, break the Ricardian equivalence here. Um, one small thing I was wondering about is whether targeted transfers might be even more efficient than a lump sum. And well, maybe the obvious question, given that we're at the, the central bank conference here, um, how is monetary policy transmission actually affected by this mechanism? I think this will also be very interesting to understand basically how, how financial stress is affecting transmission, not just of fiscal, but also of monetary policy. Yeah, so now, I'm a bit ahead of time, but this gives more time to you for questions and comments. So thank you very much. And yeah, I really enjoyed reading the paper. Do you want to react? Oh, yeah. Three, uh, or I, uh, you tell me what to oh, do. You, it's a, your paper. OK, great. So yes, uh, I would love to say a couple of words. First of all, thank you, Alina, for making uh, a great discussion. Um, so, um, j j I mean, I, I, I can talk like for a very long time about your comments, but just like few brief remarks. Uh, first, on the survey, you mentioned that uh, we did the rent survey in the U.S. in April and May uh, of 2022, and the inflation rate, say, peaked in June, I guess, 2022. Uh, so it's a special period. There is Ukraine. Um, so. There are two things. First, uh, before running this like large-scale survey, we did quite a bit of uh, piloting, and uh, and we started it in 2021 in, in the summer. So there are data points. I mean, there are very very like small samples that kind of uh, re, uh, reinforce the same point. So we, we don't see a big difference between uh, 2021 and 2022 in terms of uh, the amount of financial stress, um, and in terms of countries. We have data from uh, RCTs, uh, from the development literature, uh, from India, from African countries, uh, with administrative data where uh, actual behavior is observed. And so uh, there is evidence, significant evidence of the effect of this wealth on uh, productivity, on time lost at work. Um, magnitudes can differ from one study to another study, but it, it is present there. So if anything, I guess uh, our survey is like a lower bound of what we get uh, uh, if we calibrate our model with this data coming from the uh, RCTs. The rest, all the suggestions are very, very, very welcome. I mean, there are many things to do, uh, to, to study, to play around with this model, obviously for monetary policy purposes. Um, so monetary policy can affect uh, uh, the accumulation of wealth of people whose wealth is negative. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Okay, good. So let's turn to questions from the audience. And we will start here up front, uh, Guido, and after that, Jordi. Hi, I'm uh, Guido Scari. Um, just a brief question. So people cannot move from naivety to uh, being uh, non-naive, right? So you will think that people learn once they you know, fall in this poverty trap and uh, they understand that they are financially stressed and therefore they impair their productivity. But then they might be hit by a positive you know, income shock or whatever, and then uh, you know, they learn by this very bad experience and they try to you know, stay away from that and then become not naive anymore. Did you think about that? Uh, yes, we did. So I briefly mentioned that, but uh, I didn't emphasize that enough. In the benchmark model, uh, they can. So they're exogenously either in one camp or another. So uh, we uh, wrote an extension of the model and it's in the paper. 
where they can stochastically switch between these two states. And the probability of a switch depends on assets. So this is how uh, we thought, like, oh, if you like naive and poor, you kind of stay naive and poor uh, for a long time. But then if you, like, for some random reason, started accumulated assets, then the probability of a switch to sophistication is higher. So we didn't model uh, learning, but just this uh, a little bit exogenous switch between these two states. And so what we get there is kind of a same pattern that, uh, uh, I mean, there is a, a big mass of people close to the uh, financial borrowing limit, and these are the people who are naive. Sophisticates are never there. So those who kind of switch, they, they are uh, making everything possible to accumulate enough assets to lower this probability of becoming, again, uh, a little bit like, uh, funny in their heads, uh, naive about stress, and falling into power to trap. That's how we do it, yeah. Thanks. And there is, uh, there is, a, gr <laughs> there is a growing... And your name. Oh, Jordi Gali. Um, there is a growing literature where people introduce uh, wealth in the utility function, and I think they embed this in an otherwise standard model. So can we think of your model as provide or your paper as providing micro foundations for that and if so what are the specific insights or differential insights relative to this literature in which you have a more general specification with wealth in the utility function yeah saying this uh, uh, that's a question that we uh, uh, address a little bit in the paper so we exactly think about this financial stress uh, in this way. Uh, it can be a micro foundation for a wealth and the utility function, though there is a difference between uh, like papers existing in, in, in the literature that introduce uh, wealth, uh, say, as a separable term in the utility function or maybe affecting consumption, but not affecting this utility or working directly. So in differential implication is that we can, uh, under some parameters, skew this negative wealth effect on labor supply. The, standard, uh, the models uh, out there that have wealth in the utility function, they still uh, uh, has this property with negative wealth effect on labor supply. But uh, at some level of abstraction, yeah, this is a model with wealth in the utility function. So I have a related question, Dimitri, which is, um, so you seem to think of stress as changing preferences. Could, could you also think of it as changing beliefs? Um, yes, we can, although, I mean, there is a, this classic problem how you separate beliefs from preferences. Um, stress can, can, uh, can enter in many places, so we did consider many places except for preferences. Uh, we did uh, introduce stress into the probability of switch between two different uh, uh, idiosyncratic income states, but this was like a hard physical probability, not perceived probability. Um, it, yeah. Okay, good. Um, then we go to the left. Bear with me, so we can start with Marie and then Martin. Marie Herova, ECB. Um, I was wondering from the point of view of your model, is universal basic income a good idea? And if so, could you calibrate uh, the optimal level? And if not, why not? Thanks. So I, uh, I have to think more about it. Um, uh, so uh, one implication of our model uh, is that these transfers are good for people that are close to borrowing limit. If you, um, if you give it to everybody, we'll see people who don't work uh, that just doesn't buy it that much. Uh, so then you have to take into account how costly it is for the government. Um, yeah, but that's, uh, I mean, it, 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 it's straightforward to study this. So uh, the experiment that we did that I mentioned about this fiscal transfer, it was a one-time temporary transfer. Here the difference will be that it's permanent, and so the financing scheme of this permanent transfer will matter for, for these guys and how they perceive whether it steals their wealth or not. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you, it's Maarten de Ridder from LSC. I had the same question as Marie, so we're on the, the, the same pitch. So a follow-up would be, uh, what would be the maximum transfer that would not um, reduce labor supply? Because the result that a fiscal multiplier can be positive due to supply effects is really contrary to, to certainly what we teach to graduate students. Oh, so yeah. I imagine there's gonna be some upper limit to the amount that we can transfer to these households. Um, yeah, so it's like very parameter dependent. Uh, so I showed you this graph where the, where the labor supply is a little bit ham-shaped. Um, and so here I can point to, 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 to the location of this maximum. Um, and this is a one-time transfer. I haven't studied the permanent transfer, which, which may change things depending on top of everything on financing. Um, yeah, great. Uh, we'll, we'll do it in the follow-up thing. Okay, we are starting to approach time constraints, but I'll take two more questions here up front. Um, Yannick Hart, UPF Barcelona. Have you tried to quantify the effect on the interest rate? Because this, basically the, the naives are gonna demand less. Well, they're gonna be, uh, depending whether they're below or uh, above zero, but the, and the sophisticated are gonna save more, so this is gonna affect the supply and demand for uh, uh, funds. So we did try one thing. Uh, so in the benchmark model I showed you, it was uh, uh, the interest rate, uh, R, real interest rate, was exogenously taken. Um, we indigenized it just like by assuming that there is like outstanding supply of government bonds uh, uh, or liquid assets that the uh, agents can, uh, can, can buy. Uh, so it led to the reaction of the interest rate. Uh, we, we know the results. I cannot uh, tell you the, 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 the numbers of the top of my head. The only thing that uh, uh, was important uh, for our paper is that uh, it doesn't change, so the indigeneity of interest rate doesn't change this like uh, sophistication versus naivety plus uh, this negative labor supply versus like absence of negative uh, wealth effect on labor supply. But uh, it's very, uh, it's already in the paper, just need to uh, look up the numbers, yeah. Okay, and last question here, up front. Yeah. Hi, uh, Fabian Postelvene from University College London. Um, so just in terms of the persistence of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, stress in, in the way it's modeled here, I can't help but draw a parallel between your paper and the uh, literature on subjective uh, well-being. And it's not a literature that I know very well, but I've seen it argued that uh, people, when they get hit by an adverse shock, such as job loss or something like that, on impact they become very miserable and dissatisfied with life, and then gradually they get habituated. So if, if, if the shock is persistence, they get used to their situation. And I was wondering whether you know, that applied to, to financial shocks, in which case, if it did, then you know, the, the dynamics of you know, the impact on, on behavior might, might be quite different to, to what you're, you're predicting in your model, which is only driven by, by asset accumulation, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so uh, that go. Uh, I, I mean, that goes deeper in psychological and our psychological understanding what stress is, whether this is just a permanent state or uh, uh, it, it can be temporary, and people always mean revert to whatever average uh, happiness level. Um, so uh, there is uh, my reading of psychological uh, literature is that there is some evidence that uh, poor people uh, um, behave differently. Uh, I'm, I, I, I don't know uh, about happiness. I know about cross-country studies, and sometimes it turns out that these are poorer countries that tend to be happier. Uh, but when it comes to uh, the, the, the actual implications uh, of what we call financial stress, then it seems like it has like permanent implications. Um, yeah. Very good, so thank you very much. Dimitri, thank you, audience, for all the questions. So we go without break into the next paper. Pedro, tell us. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, very good. So thanks for including the paper. So this is a paper with uh, Sergio Rebelo and Miguel Santana. Miguel, Miguel is a student at, North, at Northwestern. He's going to be on the market next year. So we, I mean, we use a framework that's used in cognitive psychology, widely used in cognitive psychology to describe decision-making, uh, system one and system two. 
So in this framework, people use these two systems. Uh, in familiar situations, they use system one. I mean, they make uh, uh, decisions that are low cost, that are somewhat automatic. But they are prone to errors and biases. Now, in unfamiliar situations, they use system two. I mean, those are costly decisions, uh, uh, more analytical decisions that are more accurate. I mean, they are, not being, they are not going to be exact in this model. There are still going to be errors. So households use this uh, system one, system two framework to purchase consumption goods in a model that's, uh, that has the basic structure of uh, sticky price models in the sense that it's a Dixit Stiglitz uh, uh, standard model. Now, system two, I mean, this more analytical uh, way of making decisions is going to be triggered by changes in nominal prices of the goods. Now, I, we are not going to be imposing restrictions on consumers uh, or on, I mean, we are not going to be, I mean, we impose quite a lot of restrictions on consumers. We are not going to be imposing uh, uh, restrictions on uh, firms. Firms are going to be rational and they're going to be exploiting this behavior of consumers to their advantage. So the producers of goods that have a high demand relative to the racial optimum, they are going to keep their prices. And the reason is that they will try to avoid triggering uh, a reassessment of the purchase decisions. So this strategic behavior is the one that is going to generate uh, price stickiness. So it's really the, the restriction on consumers and the optimal reaction of uh, firms that generates the price rigidity. Now, I mean, once you look at, uh, at the real world, there's a few phenomena that, uh, I mean, at least talk to this uh, mechanism. So one is shrinkflation. So apparently firms are willing to go into considerable expensive changing product size instead of changing prices. I mean, this apparently was quite relevant in the recent uh, inflation episode. I mean, so much so that uh, uh, President Biden uh, decided to take his time to, to dedicate a, a Super Bowl video to, to this. So, I mean, in his words, some companies are trying to pull a fast one by shrinking the products little by little and hoping you won't notice. He was talking about ice cream in a, yeah, yeah, among other goods. I mean, subscription services, I mean, that's, those are becoming more and more uh, I mean, those uh, more used as business models, especially for streaming, software as a service. So they seem to be putting consumers on uh, autopilot, possibly to avoid triggering uh, system two. And I mean, we're all very familiar with convenient prices, prices clo very close to a round number that, uh, I mean, possibly create a perception that the price is lower than what it is, and there's evidence that these prices are less likely to change. Okay, what we get with the model? Um, uh, the model is, is going to be consisting with a puzzling uh, phenomenon that's rockets and feathers. It's called rockets and feathers. Prices rise faster when costs go up, then they fall when costs go down. I mean, this was uh, identified uh, in the 90s for markets like gas and agricultural products, but then Peltzman showed that it's more widely applied. Um, the model is also going to be consisting, consistent with uh, a fact that was identified recently by Ilud Falchev and Vincent uh, in an econometric paper. Uh, we call it sticky winners, so firms that receive a high demand uh, realization are less likely to change their prices. And I mean, we get results for optimal monetary policy. So in our model, it's actually not optimal to follow price stability. Uh, small deflation is actually better than uh, price uh, stability. Okay, so very briefly, um, the literatures, the related literatures. So we build, uh, um, we build on Ilut and Falchev, on uh, I mean a, 
uh, way of modeling uh, system one and system two. That's a more recent paper. Um, I mean, the, the reference in the, in the psychology literature, uh, the more formal evidence uh, reference is Stanovich and West. I mean, this was popularized by a book that you probably know, uh, Daniel Kahneman's book on thinking fast and slow. Uh, I mean, then there's, I mean, it talks to the literature on price stickiness with information frictions. I would, uh, um, um, uh, I would, uh, I mean, the paper that's closest is Matesh Mateshka's paper on uh, um, the behavior of firms when uh, uh, agents have uh, uh, rational inattention. I mean, they, he finds that uh, uh, firms are going to, to, set uh, prices among some reference uh, prices. I mean, and then there's the literature on rockets and feathers, and there's the literature on opti optimum monetary policy. Okay, let me go through the models, through the, through the analytics. Uh, I mean, I hope I'm, I'm not going to, um, to stress you t uh, too much. Uh, I mean, in the, sh in the short time I have. So, uh, household preferences, I mean, very standard, except for this term, oh, well, this probably doesn't point, ah, this term here, which is the cognitive costs. I mean, other than that, a composite good, power utility, uh, constant uh, elasticity of labor, and differentiated goods. The production is going to be linear, and firms are more optimistic competitive. Now, in the um, in the full rationality benchmark, there's no cognitive cost. Uh, and the solution is the one we, I mean, we are very familiar with. There's going to be an individual demand for, the, for each product as a function of the relative price. There's conditions for the, the aggregate uh, consumption and labor and the definition and the expression for the price level. Now, I mean, the interesting part is how, how to deal with the bounded rationality here. And again, I mean, we build on Ilut and Valchev. So the household here knows the state, but the household cannot, doesn't really know the policy function, cannot, uh, I mean, has uh, uh, troubles figuring out uh, the exact policy function. So the, the decision for the individual consumption, the optimal individual consumption, and the optimal labor. So the household is going to have stochastic beliefs over this, uh, uh, over this demand. Uh, and we are going to assume that uncertainty is about the relation between the individual price and the individual good. Now, the household is going to, to draw uh, costly signals uh, and uh, it's going to decide uh, uh, the demand based on, uh, on those signals. Uh, labor is going to be the adjusting variable. I mean, given the, the optimal decision, I mean, the decision for consumption, labor adjusts to satisfy the budget constraint. Now, the model is, is going to be static. It's going to be, it's going to be period one, but we actually need a period zero in order to make sense of the initial conditions, uh, in order for the initial conditions to be, to be I mean, for the problem to, to be meaningful in some sense. So, um, so households are going to be starting with, I mean, in each period, period zero and period one, the households start with the prior, with some mean and uh, variance covariance. Um, I mean, the, those are going to be functions of this uh, uh, individual price. Um, then the household observes the price in each period and is going to be choosing the precision of the signal. The signal is a normal signal centered in the rational demand. Based on the signal, the household sets the, sets the demand equal to the mean of the posterior. And the, the cost of, uh, of learning, of, uh, uh, of drawing the signal, is uh, according to, the, to a standard form in the rational inattention uh, literature. So the cost is proportional to the, to the reduction in the variance of the beliefs uh, due, to the, um, um, due to the signal. So it's going to, there's going to be some cost kappa here. I mean, the optimal solution is actually 
a simple rule. So if the variance of the, of the prior uh, was relatively high, so if the prior was very dispersed, if the variance was higher than kappa, then the variance is reduced to kappa. There's learning and the variance is reduced to kappa. Otherwise, there's no learning and the posterior is equal to the prior. Now, we are going to be assuming, I mean, those are the initial conditions, that's why you need period zero, that the initial prior is very dispersed in period zero. So there's always going to be learning whatever the realized price is. So given the realized price, there's going to be learning for that price. And the, and the, uh, I mean, and the variance of the beliefs is reduced to, to kappa. I mean, for other prices, there's not going to be learning. I mean, then there's going to be, there's going to be, uh, I mean, the mean of the posterior is going to be, is going to use the, uh, the signal uh, to be updated. Uh, okay, now we go to period one. In period one, I mean, the, the consumer starts, uh, I mean, has the consumer observed the price in period zero? has uh, a relatively precise beliefs for that price, but has, uh, I mean, more dispersed beliefs for, uh, for any other prices. So if the price is the one observed in period zero, there's not going to be learning. Otherwise, there's going to be learning. Now, what, does the, what this does to the, to the demand functions is that we have demand functions in period one that, are, that if the price is the price in period zero, if the price stays the same, then the shock uh, from the signal is the one of period zero, and the price is the one of period zero. If the price is changed, then there is a new draw of, um, of a demand shock, and this is the new demand. Now let's go to the problem of the firm. So firm, firms, they observe the shock in period zero, but they don't observe the shock in period one. So they have to, I mean, they only observe the shock after, after they set the price. I mean, it's the price that in some sense triggers the shock. So when they are deciding, they can either get, I mean, either keep the price constant and then they are going to get the draw, I mean, the demand draw of period zero. But they are going to possibly, if there's inflation, they are possibly going to get a markup that's not going to be the optimal markup. I mean, the, the, the price is going to be different from the optimal reset price, which is a constant markup over marginal cost, if they keep the price constant. Otherwise, they are going to draw from the from the distribution of demand shocks, and they're going to choose the constant markup of a marginal cost, the optimal reset price. And that's the trade-off. The trade-off is between the optimal markup and possibly a good demand draw that they may have gotten in period zero. So firms that got a, a relatively high draw, demand draw, those are the firms that are going to keep uh, uh, prices constant. I mean, firms that uh, uh, were unlucky to get a relatively low draw, they are going to change prices. So we are going to have, I mean, this is, this is coming from the definition of the price level. This is the share of firms that keep the price constant, and they're going to, I mean, this is the relative price, it buys inflation. So the relative price is going to be relatively low if there is, uh, if there is inflation. The firms that change price, and uh, I mean, again, that's endogenous, they are going to be able to set the, uh, the relative price to the, to the optimal markup. And all these variables are just uh, a function of inflation. Now, there's going to be a key asymmetry that explains the, is going to explain the results of uh, rockets and feathers, that when inflation is, uh, is uh, high, then the, if inflation is high, then this margin is going to be, is going to be low, possibly very low, possibly zero or, or negative. 
and then the firm always wants to, to reset the price. If, the pri if, infl if uh, instead you have deflation, uh, then this margin is going, to be, is going to be higher. The firm is going to be losing because of the elasticity, the price elasticity, but there's still going to be firms with that, I mean, provided there's a sufficiently high demand draw, that will prefer to keep the price constant. And that asymmetry is going to, to give us the result of rockets and feathers. That uh, when inflation goes up, uh, eventually all firms will want to change prices. When inflation goes down, there's still a share of firms that want to keep uh, prices. Um, okay, so we, in this, in this economy, uh, the allocation is always inefficient because there's all, always these demand shocks that are coming from uh, bounded rationality. So there's always going to be a distortion. I mean, this is the resource constraint for the optimal C. For the actual consumption, aggregate consumption, there's an additional term, but there's always an inefficiency. Now, to simplify, we are going to do, Monte I mean, we are going to do policy in two ways. So there's going to be a subsidy that tries to correct for for the marginal distortion. Um, uh, but uh, the monetary policy is going to be um, nominal demand, uh, uh, I mean, a gross rate of money in some sense, or a target of nominal demand. Okay, I'm going to spare you with, uh, I mean, some of this uh, algebra for the equilibrium conditions for market clearing. Get to the get to the results. So the first result, rockets and feathers. So what we do is we do comparative statics. Uh, f uh, so there's a of different costs. So there's this V uh, uh, term here, uh, which uh, determines uh, productivity. So if V is uh, is um, um, I mean V is positive. So Productivity is either low or high. And what we show is that uh, um, when, productivity, when productivity is low, so costs are high, inflation is uh, higher in uh, absolute terms. So if the, if the, I mean, if the cost is low, there's going to be, uh, there's going to be deflation but deflation in absolute value is lower than inflation. Than inflation. I mean, we can show this for a particular case. We can show it analytically, but we can show it, uh, I mean, we tried uh, different uh, uh, solution, numerical solutions, uh, and, but, and it always came out that uh, for sufficiently high um, uh, costs, sufficiently high V, uh, inflation, when uh, there was a cost increase, was always higher than uh, minus uh, than deflation in absolute uh, value uh, for a cost decrease. Uh, okay, and again, uh, I mean the, intu the intuition is uh, is is really very clear. It uh, has to do with the effect. On, uh, on margins and, uh, and on uh, profits and uh, how, this is, uh, how this is compensated by the, by the initial shock. Now, let me tell you about optimal policy. So, so again, optimal policy is for a subsidy, for a, a tax subsidy and for inflation. I mean, the part of the tax subsidy is, uh, I don't find it incredibly interesting but part of, of inflation, I, I think it's worth uh, uh, going through. So, so this is again, I mean, this is uh, the utility function. Uh, I mean, the indirect utility function as a function of the, of the, of the tax, of the proportional tax and the, and the inflation. And here you see the effect of, uh, of inflation on the, on the cognitive costs. So this is the fraction of firms that, uh, that are flexible. The larger, is, uh, um, the larger is the 
I mean, one minus, a, minus k is the fraction of firms that are flexible. The larger is the number of firms that are flexible, the larger are the cognitive costs because these firms are going to be changing prices and firm, and that will trigger system two. And then uh, the initial variance, the higher is the initial variance because of the way we model the cost, the higher are the cognitive costs too because uh, you'll need to be reducing this variance uh, and the, the cost is going to be a function of the, of the reduction, the proportionate reduction in the variance. Now let me tell you about uh, optimal monetary policy. So what we can show is that uh, if uh, cognitive costs are high enough, then price stability is optimal. So for sufficiently high cognitive costs, it's better to just avoid them and the uh, price stability is better. Now, what's more interesting is uh, uh, where the optimal deflation is coming for, from. So marginally, it's, it's better to have deflation. And the reason is, let me try to, <coughs> to tell you uh, some intuition. So if you, so again, I mean, if you have price stability, you minimize cognitive costs. So that's a reason for price stability. I mean, if you have price stability, you also minimize uh, dispersion coming from relative prices. So this consumption is going to be equal to this consumption. I mean, this pi is going to be one. This uh, optimal reset price is also going to be one. These two consumptions are going to be the same. Now, the reason to deviate from price stability is because of selection. It's because uh, uh, the sticky firms are the firms that uh, uh, have high demand. And the planner here wants to reduce uh, this suboptimal high demand for the sticky firms. The way to do that is by raising their relative price, and it's going to be raising by the relative price if there's a deflation. I mean, remember that these are the firms that have their prices uh, sticky. If there's deflation, their relative price is going to be going up, and there's a way to reduce uh, and if, so if you have deflation, you reduce the relative price, so that moves you for away from uh, price stability. Okay, so I can conclude. Uh, again, dual framework uh, 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 for household uh, decision making. Um, I mean, that gives us a, a new kind of price rigidity due to the strategic behavior of firms. I mean, for some cost shocks, for some inflation rates, some producers do not want to change their prices. I mean, we get to explain at least part of, uh, of rockets and feathers, certainly part, only part of it. Uh, I mean, apparently it's really pervasive. Uh, and we get these results for optimal monetary policy. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, Pedro's paper will be discussed by Gaetano Gabalo. Have uh, 15 minutes. Yeah. The, ah, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, great conference and uh, to dis uh, to, uh, I, having asked to discuss this paper that uh, is very, very uh, interesting for, 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 for me and for what I do. So I, let, let me summarize, first of all, the, the main idea. Okay? So I think it's a, it's a beautiful idea. I'm, I'm completely on board on that, which is the fact that households are more attentive in spending choices when posted prices change. So imagine yourself, you go on the user shop, you, you are used to buy your milk at $4, and suddenly uh, you see that your milk costs for four dollar and half, and you say, "What's going on?" So you 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 pause and you think, "Is it worth that I buy this milk? How important it is, or what is happening, uh, etc." This is literally what is happening in the in the in the, in the paper, meaning like even for milk and even for uh, whatever goods is is there. Um, and based on this, on this idea, then uh, what the paper does is thinking how firms use this behavior of households to, uh, to gain and to make higher profits. 
and uh, in particular, they think strategically whether or not they have to, to change prices in which, in which uh, uh, and I think this is very realistic. Like I can see CEOs in companies that say, okay, well, so we are, we are selling uh, a lot of goods, why we need to, to change price, maybe we, we can adjust in other ways. So I'm completely uh, 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 on board for this idea. So what I'm trying to do here is, as, uh, as a discussant, try to, to, to simplify the model as, as much as possible so that uh, we can go through the elements and, and try to, uh, to, to grasp what is the logic, uh, uh, the internal logic of the model. So to do that, I, let, let me just show my, my toy model, one slide that I think can summarize uh, most of the action. So, Think about the firm at time t minus one that has an optimal markup. So think about in real terms. This is mu is the optimal markup uh, uh, for a given level of demand elasticity, gamma. Uh, and this is the, the, the starting situation. Then at time t, there is some inflation. Okay, so inflation is there. And uh, the, the households behave as follows. So if they see no nominal change, then they just stick with a with a stochastic demand. Okay, so there is demand is is random. There is a realization for for the household, and if they don't see any nominal change, that is the demand that they will stick with. Okay, so now no nominal change means that the price in real terms has changed. Okay, so the the, the markup gets eroded by inflation. Okay, and so the real price is not any longer. Uh, mu by is mu over one plus uh, uh, the inflation. Otherwise, uh, the, the, if the representative household, if the household see a different price, then they choose the optimal demand. Okay, so in the model of Pedro, they are just drawing another signal, but let's go extreme. They, they, they do the right thing. Okay, so what the firm is doing on its, on its side? Um, the firm see the demand, the random demand, so they know like what is the demand for the old price. They have their estimate. I don't know how to think about it, but they know this uh, fictitious demand. And their choice is the following. So they compare the blue profits, are the profits that they get if they don't change price. So their markup get deflated. Okay, I'm taking one as a real cost here. And, 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 and this, this net markup it get multiplied by the random demand that they know, okay? And they compare this situation to the situation in which they instead re-optimize. And so they, 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 they put back, they change the nominal price so that the markup in real terms is still mu, okay? And they compare these two. So now if you, if you think about this problem, uh, you understand that there is a threshold of demand above which they will decide to not change prices and below which they decide to change price. Okay? So for me, it was instructive to, to draw uh, this picture in which uh, I draw the threshold uh, demand as a function of pi inflation. So if pi, uh, so this is an example in which the optimal markup is 20%. So if inflation is above 20%, you have negative markup, net markup. So you're going to change. So all the region on the right of uh, 0.2 are flexible prices. As inflation becomes closer to zero, then there are some firms that are lucky because they, their draw is above the threshold and they stick with their price. Okay, so this is the, the white area. And as you see, as you go negative with deflation, then there are more and more firms that decide to stick to their prices because they are, uh, the threshold is very low, so they are lucky and, and they don't want to change price. And this is the origin of the, the rockets and faders uh, phenomenon because any inflation is likely to be very promptly, quickly transmitted because um, uh, erodes the, the net markup and, and it goes very quickly to negative. So it's, for them, is they have no choice of resetting price. But instead, deflation, 
uh, deflation is increasing the real price. So they are, the, 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 the net markup goes up. Any demand will be good to, 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 to keep, um, as long as demand is above a certain threshold. So now, with this simple example, I, I do an experiment. I try to, uh, what happens if I vary the elasticity of demand? So this is what you get if, if you go to the competitive, okay? Let's go to the limit of full, comp uh, perfect competition. So what happens uh, even, so here uh, you are at the limit of zero profits. So any positive inflation will make you go negative. So any positive inflation is going to be transmitted one to one because all the firms are flexible. On the other side, instead, the threshold has to be very, very is very, very low. So uh, with, with deflation, most of the firms are not going to change prices because they can get a slightly positive net markup, so they are happy with any quantity they can sell, okay? So already from, from this uh, comparison, you, 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 can, you can really realize that this, uh, uh, so the, 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 the demand elasticity is a key factor, okay? So, and this, the, so the, the bottom line of this picture is that uh, rockets and feathers uh, phenomena become more extreme with uh, more competitiveness. So more perfect competition. So as you are closer to perfect competition, then any positive inflation is very, grow very rapidly, and any deflation gets stuck and doesn't go so deep. Okay. So this is is, is in a, in uh, in essence the logic of of the paper. Uh, I mean, as far as I understood, then uh, Pedro, correct me if I'm wrong. So, to summarize the result, uh, if you, th I mean, for me, it was very useful to think about the limit of perfect competition. You have inflation, then it passes through is full, and you have a rocket. Then, do you, uh, if you have a negative, a negative uh, uh, nominal shock, then you have very uh, low pass through, and so this is a feeder. And it, the logic is there. It's, it's very robust to any change you may want to add. Let's go to welfare. I think a welfare lesson is, OK, so if you go, uh, if you have an inflationary shock, what is happening? That people are using a lot of cognitive cost, but their location is better, is, is because people are thinking what, how much they want to buy. And, and so they optimize their demand. Uh, and, and, and so the, the real cost that, that is paid is, is cognitive cost. On the other hand, on deflation, uh, you have more uh, random, random demand, uh, but you have less cognitive cost. Okay, so this is the trade-off that you, 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 you have to think about when, when you go to welfare. And this leads you to think about optimal policy in a very uh, clean way. So if uh, cognitive costs are high, you like price stability. You don't want people to think that much, okay? At the same time, you don't want to, to shake the economy. Uh, and, and so price stability become uh, a good anchor. But if the cognitive costs are low, uh, an implication, for example, my, on my model is that, of the toy model, is that inflation become better than deflation. Why? Because inflation, in, in, at the limit of perfect competition, um, all the prices, uh, there, there are no um, uh, dispersion in real prices, all the price increase with, with inflation, and demand is optimal. Um, and this is better than deflation, in, instead where you have this allocation cost that is quite important. Now, in the paper, uh, now that I saw the presentation, you are emphasizing deflation better than price stability. So maybe this is a question like what, what happens, yeah, if there is any difference from my model or, uh, it's the toy model, right? Okay. Uh, so uh, there is a lot to like. What I, what I like is the fact that they really play on this, uh, d um, uh, on, on, on the fact that you can get positive profits at any demand level, but not at any price level, and this is the source of, of the asymmetry. And I like very much the fact that prices are used strategically by firms, uh, because they know that as price uh, move, they move household beliefs, they move household's attention, Okay, and, uh, and I'm going to say something more about this. And I also like the, the kind of empirical question that uh, emerged from this, 
Uh, one is about, the, of course, the asymmetry, but if you go deeper, uh, so you have an asymmetry in all the, the, the movement of the cycle. So uh, the contracyclicality of, of the aggregate markup is going to be uh, asymmetric. And mm, market concentration, as I show, is something important to understand uh, the uh, business cycle fluctuation. Then let me, let me go a bit more in the, in the detail of the, uh, how the, the model is constructed and make some point um, that, I mean, was what uh, um, drove me to think deeper about the, 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 the model. So I want to emphasize that there are some important elements of non-rationality that are central to the normative analysis. So we, if we want to believe in the normative analysis, we have to think that there are some, some, some elements that are uh, non-rational. So uh, there is a lot of emphasis on rational inattention, but I will say it plays a cosmetic role here in the sense that we, we, you don't embrace fully the, the philosophy of, of rational inattention. Um, and, and, and my way to, to say that is that so price in this, in this environment is a trigger, but not a signal, in the sense that it triggers attention, but is not used and there's no consequence for the way people think about it, okay? Uh, and this was like natural uh, uh, to think of for me because I, I, I work on this, on this idea that um, people learn from prices and for example, I have paper in which uh, inflation leads to, to more intense household price hunting. Uh, or um, the paper in which current inflation is a free signal, just, I mean, little advertising on the fact that uh, this is really uh, central to my research agenda. And so uh, the effect of reading the paper was to generate appetite for, for like, uh, yeah, I want to really exploit that, that, that thing. Um, but where I think it, there is the most important element is the fact that these, these agents decide to revise demand no matter how little is the price change. Like, okay, in the example of the milk, suppose the milk go from $4 to $4.01. One cent. This guy think deeply about what they have to do, okay? But I think there is an opportunity cost that one could, could work out. So, okay, so there is one cent change, how important is for me to sit down and think about this? Okay, and this is not considered uh, in the model. Um, and I think when you, it goes to welfare, um, it matters because there is a cognitive cost that the, that the agents do not, do not account properly. Like I, I, don't, I, I use my cognitive cost no matter if the revision is one cent or the revision is 50 cent or 100. Uh, uh, dollars, okay, and what what good is that? Uh, how important is for my consumption? So probably, if something like uh, a, a, a follow up could be, okay, let's 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 measure uh, how uh, what is the incentive for people to revise the demand, how much they benefit, how much it costs, okay. Um, and the other is about the representative agent. Yeah, I this last slide. Uh, so here there is a representative agent that do mistake about the variety, but how to think about that? I think uh, uh, agents uh, are more uh, thinking in terms of bundles, so they could observe multiple prices and they could reason in terms of the bundle they want to buy instead of the single price. So when there are some um, uh, firm that do not revise the price, maybe their competitors are revising the price and this has influence for their demand. So. I, I, I could not, uh, so here maybe I, I will need a story about that and uh, uh, about how these mistakes have implication f in a dynamic setting. That, that were my curiosity. And otherwise, I think this is a beautiful model of behavioral demand more than behavioral prices, I would say, uh, and optimal pricing. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Gatano. Okay, before we turn uh, to you in the audience, uh, Peter, you may want to react in particular to okay, maybe, what maybe. elements are missing from the, t the toy model. <laughs> okay, maybe it's better if I... So, Gaetano has a toy model, we have a Mickey Mouse model, so, so <laughs> uh, that explains some of the, I mean, of his criticisms. Um, 
Okay, one thing that's missing in the toy model is the demand elasticity. So the demand is inelastic in uh, mm -hmm. Gaetano's model. In our model, it's not. So when you reduce the, when there is deflation, the margin is going down. Uh, prices are going are becoming relatively higher. So agents uh, move away from the consumption of this good, and that's uh, that reduces profits. Uh, so there's a, I mean the your curve, your threshold curve is U-shaped uh, when there is deflation. It's just that uh, it's not uh, symmetric. Mm -hmm. So prices go up. I mean, the threshold is, goes up uh, uh, faster when there is inflation than the, the, when there is deflation. Ah, okay. And so, see, so when, when you ask me about the, the impact of uh, competition, actually in the data, when they first identified the rockets and feathers, they found it for markets that were kind of competitive, like gas and agricultural products. Yeah. But then uh, Pelsman actually showed that there was no correlation with measures of imperfect uh, if, uh, competition. So, I, I mean, but these are all relatively late, uh, uh, res uh, early, I mean, uh, old uh, research. So. But, an but anyway, I don't know exactly how competition plays uh, when, when you actually model the elasticity and you compare these two, these two branches. Now, um, rational inattention. I mean, this is really not a model of uh, rational inattention. It would be great to introduce mm. elements of that, I mean, as, you, as you've been working on, but uh, I mean, it's really, it's a model of uh, cognitive costs. I mean, uh, uh, agents are really not learning anything. I mean, um, now, I mean, the, your point about uh, an infinitesimal change in price triggering system too is a, I mean, is a really important point, but that's where the Mickey Mouse model plays an important role. I mean, we make an important assumption that the, the, the I mean, these beliefs are independent across different prices, so it's enough that, so we don't really learn anything from, mm. uh, from a new price. I mean, once you move to a new price, the old price was, no. was irrelevant for, for your beliefs. So, so then you just uh, decide to learn again. I mean, if we had modeled a more, I mean, a, a variance, a covariance matrix that was not uh, diagonal, we would have a much more complicated system one. I mean, this would be a much more complicated paper, but we'll get uh, some of those results. But we, we actually, I mean, we thought this was actually a really uh, smart, smart way of uh, moving uh, Forward. fast. Mm. I mean, because we, we don't want to have a quantitative model. We want to have a, um, a, a framework where we can discuss uh, some uh, results. Now, another important point, representative agent. I mean, the way we think about it is if we had uh, um, multiple agents, that their shocks would be correlated. And we'd be thinking about like social media, uh, fashion, uh, trends. Okay, but I mean, thanks again. I mean, really sharp points on the, on the uh, ma major uh, mechanism of the pipe. Thank you. Good, thank you. So, wants to go first. We have Laura here up front. Mike is coming. Thank you. Laura Gatti, ECB. So I have a very quick question, which is, what is your framework's implication for sales? Uh, meaning, uh, uh, what exactly do you mean? One prominent feature of the data is that firms engage in sales, right? So this ah, is, sales. Okay. This is what you yeah. know, a, a complication of measurement okay, I, of I, inflation. I, I mean, uh, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, one way you could think about it is, uh, again, kind of uh, uh, reference prices. So, so it's really moving. From, see, I, I mean, I I buy a lot online. And I always, I mean, I buy some, some things from a, a site that always has sales. So, and I buy when they have this sale, it's always like, I don't know, 10% or whatever. But then, I mean, l lately they increase the reference, I mean, the, the well, I don't know exactly, I mean, the, the price that's, I mean, without, without the sale. And then when they did that, I went around 
shopping, trying to figure out if I was making the, I mean, if, <laughs> if that site was the best uh, place to, to buy. So, I mean I, I mean, I really knew how they worked, but when they changed their, refer I mean, their main uh, uh, price, uh, then, uh, uh, then that's what triggered my action. Okay, Bartosz here. Uh, yes, Bartosz Maćkowiak, ECB. So consumers in the model seem to have a little bit of a split personality, a mix of sophistication and behavioral, which I think is important in the model. So uh, when the relative price changes for a given nominal price, they realize the implications for their optimal behavior with no cognitive cost. But when the nominal price changes, then they need to, tr then they need to incur these cognitive costs. And I think this is important in the model, in particular for, op for the optimal policy result that you emphasized. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, that's that assumption that uh, they are only uncertain about the relationship between the individual price and individual consumption. I mean, we would want to do it in a different way, in a way where agents would be uncertain about the relationship between all the state variables and consumption in a way that would be weighting the different uh, states. Uh, we are actually working on a version of the model. I mean, on a, I mean, we are starting to think about a very different paper where we'll be doing that, probably applied to a different question. Sergey, you don't need a mic. Dimitri. Uh, sorry, Dimitri, I'm really sorry. Um, yeah, uh, Pedro, uh, the following question I have. Imagine uh, you send your agents to an island with like high and chronic inflation. Uh, what do you think will trigger their system to on, on, on that island? Um, I mean, they're still, I mean, in that, uh, I mean, in that island, uh, I mean, all prices will be moving. So there'll be, I mean, system two will be triggered by the movement in, any, in every individual price, and therefore the movement in, uh, average, inf in uh, average inflation. So average inflation affects the, I mean, affects this, uh, uh, I mean, this, uh, I mean, whatever, this way of making decisions through the individual prices, but in the end, you get that in a, environment with high inflation, you pretty much have flexible prices. So these guys will always be system two, essentially. Yeah, they'll all be, yeah, they be going around, uh, trying to figure out. Uh, yeah. but, but, but the key you think still will be a price will be, I mean, change, the, it's going the to be through the individual the trend uh, yeah, inflation. Yeah, it's going to be through the, through the individual. Mm. Because each, I mean, yeah, each individual, each individual producer mm. will have the, the markups going down and will want to to change prices, so that's going to trigger the revision. Mm. Martin here on the left. Thanks a lot. So I'm, I'm an outsider to this price rigidity literature, but I've worked a bit on, on, on wage rigidity. And there seems to be this really interesting revival of very serious theories of price rigidity, and this paper was a fantastic example. But one difference with the wage rigidity literature is that there seems to be no focus on trying to fix price rigidity. As right? so in wages, there's active policy debate about how to make labor markets more flexible, more fluid, how to prevent regulation that leads to automatic indexation, etc. But for price rigidity, there appears to be none of that. Right? So my question broadly to, to Pedro and maybe also to, to Luke as Director General of, of Research here is, should there be a research agenda to try and think more of price rigidity as, as, a, as a variable that might be shaped by policy and might be reduced to make nominal shocks less, uh, less harmful? I mean, ov obviously here, um, I mean, the, the, the price rigidity mechanism and, uh, um, and I mean, if you translate that to, to wages, I think the mechanism would be there as well because, uh, um, I mean, if you, 
if you lower wages or if you raise wages, I mean, if you lower wages, people get, can get upset. I mean, that's not the mechanism we have here. But if you raise wages, people can think, why have they raised wa my wage? I mean, maybe, maybe I should look around to see if uh, I get a better deal somewhere else. So the mechanism is going to be there. And uh, I mean, it plays a, a role uh, in uh, optimal policy. I mean, the, 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 the planner wants to, uh, wants to take that into account, wants to take into account the cognitive costs and the distortions due to the, to the price stickiness. I mean, that's, that's the optimal policy problem that we solve there. I mean, in practice, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, well, in practice, it's one of our two main research programs here. We have something called the Prisma Network, um, where we at least try to understand price rigidities. But I think the, the fair answer to your question is that we love price rigidities, because without them, we would be mostly out of business here. <laughs> <laughs> so we leave this to others to fix. Um, OK, so I think this was a great uh, session. Um, so welcome a round of applause for the speakers. <laughs>